I mean, I lived in Seattle for a couple of years, and I still think about moving back often. And I think it's because it's a much more manageable city. Because New York has everything, right? But it's almost sensory overload. And there everything is available to you, but it also depends on how much money you have and access and the rest of it. And so you might have a million things you want to do in a night, but you're doing one thing. And if that thing is terrible, you're going home because you're not going to be able to just you know, do all this stuff because of transportation and costs and everything. And in smaller cities, like, I remember I used to do gigs and then go to a show and be home by nine. Like, that's not possible here. And I think in smaller cities, you just have a lot more control. And um, you also, it's not like you don't have great restaurants. And certainly the population is not nearly as diverse as New York. And that's something it's that is hard to replicate in most places. So I get that. And that obviously is something I think about. But yeah, I, I I I do think smaller cities can work, um, because New York is hard. I grew up here, and it's hard. I'm actually from the San Francisco Bay Area originally, which I go back all the time for for my my main job. I, I'm a technology journalist, so you know I'm I'm back and forth like eight times a year, and I fully get the criticism, and and you know it, it's it, it's it's just. It's a, it's a it's a real bummer. It's such a beautiful, wonderful city, and it has become just an impossible place to live. And 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 I bring it up mainly because I, I love Seattle too, but it really feels like Seattle is pretty rapidly heading in that direction as well. Yeah, Amazon's really done a number on it, and uh, it's it's kind of a bummer. It's not kind of it is a bummer. I mean, I think there's so many things about. Um, Seattle that made it special, like how distinct the neighborhoods were and um, the kind of history. Because it really was isolated in a lot of ways, you know, like it was it had its own thing going on because it was so far away from everywhere else. And now all of a sudden it kind of has lost some of that flavor. I mean, part of it, it, it's as simple as Capitol Hill has been like the, you know, the gay district forever in Seattle. And I remember going back and all of a sudden there are rainbow flags painted on the uh, the crosswalks and i'm like that's not a good sign because if you have to make it clear that this is the gay district that means it's lost something you know and then when you hear about hate crimes that are happening anti-gay hate crimes in in capitol hill it's like dear god like people don't know what how like how these communities work and what the history is because they're new or because they heard it's cool and they're coming in from the suburbs or the experts and i think it's all part of the like the depressing part of gentrification and when these big companies kind of take over. I think in a lot of ways the the gay community is kind of, is often at the tip of that spear in terms of like you know I, I, gentrifying gentrification is is a bad word and, and for good reasons, but they're often you know the first people I know like a lot of places I lived in in, in Brooklyn, which uh, I, I've I've since gone back and visited, and you know there's like a is it like a beer garden across from where I used to live? But there was always in every building, like there, there was, a, there was always a gay couple there. So, you know, it's, they're, they're there early on. And then when things open up, then I guess they yeah, pay some consequence for that. I mean, I guess, you know, for, for Capitol Hill, like I was talking about Seattle, I don't really know the history of the gentrification of there, but I, I, I know that like it has been a, a gay district for quite some time. Like it, it, it was. It's been a really important place where, you know, one of the big, another big thing is they had like a. There's always been a big pride parade, and all of a sudden there was one downtown or about in Queen Anne, and it was this weird, um, like wow, it's gotten commercial, and it's also a sign that money is being infused because, like, you know, this this particular part of of Seattle, like it's. Um, it's pretty well established. Like, you know, it, it's not so much that the gentrification started with members of the gay community. I really don't know the history, but it is more of like, wow, like now all of a sudden, uh, even that is being damaged. Yeah, I, I guess I forget it partly because it's like, of course, you would want to move to the place where the gay people are. You know, that's like they're, they're bringing all this culture. They're bringing these like ni- nice stores and restaurants. They're bringing the exact... Li- Exactly the thing that, you know, whether it's like Wall Street people here or or tech people there ultimately want. I feel like, I mean, that's often true even with 
neighborhoods of color, like people love diversity and they love, they want a cultural experience. And by moving there, they're part of the destruction of that cultural experience. I mean, that's, you know, kind of the irony of it. Like it's not going to like when when all of a sudden restaurants are catering to white new white clientele, that's going to affect like the what the place is. And also there is a freedom that comes with. And, you know, certainly I'm sure this is true in Capitol Hill. And that's how I felt in South Asian like neighborhoods, like a sense of I don't need to think of myself in relation to whiteness. When I'm in this space, I'm brown like everyone else. And there's an intricacy of our identities that is much more important than like how we are in comparison to this larger uh, paradigm. And I, I, you know, that, that goes away. The idea that like, you know, I think about Williamsburg and where my, um, my brother has lived in historically Puerto Rican and Dominican areas and my brothers lived there for quite some time and it's all of a sudden it goes from this is a dominican and puerto rican neighborhood to people crossing the street because they're afraid of the dominican and puerto rican people who've historically lived there i'm like are you kidding me like you're the intruders like this has been home for quite some time like as as if like there is an enemy at the gate and it's like no 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 you're inside the gate you walked inside the gate so yeah, I don't, I did, yeah, I guess I didn't expect to talk about gentrification so quickly, but I, I do appreciate it. This is something that I, that I had to be mindful of when I moved out here because, you know, I, I did move to, I, you know, I, I moved to places that I could afford. Of course. And I wasn't, I, I, I was never poor in any meaningful sense. I was, I was broke and I had to be mindful of knowing that, like, that, that I that I do have a safety net that a lot of people aren't aren't afforded and, and and that maybe and I look back on it and there are certain things that I I tend to romanticize about that point in my life that it's like I, mean, I don't know maybe maybe it's not healthy to romanticize other people's struggles. I think it's never good to obviously like uh, bathe any paint anybody with a broad stroke, right? Like so you know the same thing with romanticizing struggle it's an assumption of what that struggle looked like for individuals and it's also kind of a, a romanticization of it well it's also like i'm getting to witness this and be part of it uh, of what they're they're experiencing in some peripheral way that i don't think is necessarily the healthiest thing well that's it right i mean the peripheral part is it it's like it, it's what heisenberg and certainty principle uh, it's it, you you effectively observe you change things by observing. Yes. And certainly, like, you change things by just the act of, like, being in that neighborhood and, and living in that apartment with your other, like, you know, your other uh, uh, liberal arts friends. And, well, it's also the idea that whether or not you want to see it this way, it, it's like... This is anthropological. Maybe not by choice. That's not necessarily why you move to the neighborhood. You move there for rent. But, like, when you see people that you're not used to living with that I have different cultures than what you grew up with. There's going to be an inquisitiveness, which is makes sense. And a, and a certain degree of how does it work here? And what, what do these symbols mean? And um, it, it, it all for the people that have been there, like, it's not like they can't feel it. Like they feel that like this person is not one of the people who's lived here a long time. Uh, you know, what is it that they want? The questions they're asking are, are putting me at this place where I have to explain things. It, like, changes the dynamics and the power dynamics of the place. And I think it's to what you said, like, it's not like uh, even if you're not actively engaging, just the, your presence is going to have an impact. I suspect probably one of the strongest reasons to want to raise a child here is that racism has to be learned. And if you just grow up around all sorts of different people, it's not this, it's not this innate thing that you have. I mean, I think that there is still like New York still has racism. I grew up, you know, in, of course, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. like, and, and even in diverse settings, if anything, the racism, if anything is more intricate and culturally competent. hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. I, I just mean from the standpoint of like having a kid around oh, a lot yeah. of other people. I mean, yeah. It, it's just, it's crucial. I mean, like, 
It's funny when you come from like really progressive cities or areas and you have certain values and you move to New York. Because I've had friends from Seattle move to New York and the things they've, they've been saying for years, all of a sudden they're, they're not like, because it's messy. It's not like people of color oppressed, queer folks oppressed. And, and it's like, it's never that simple. Like, you're going to have people who are homophobic but, like, are part of an uh, oppressed group. You're going to have people uh, that are gay but racist. Like, th- these th- – it's not as straightforward as, like, everyone's uh, – you know, it's, like, one, one – like, you're either somebody who's oppressed or the oppressor. It's never that simple. And so all of a sudden you're in a crowded subway train and – you know, you have an altercation with somebody who's a person of color and all of a sudden you've never had that altercation because you grew up in a place where there were no people of color. So can you see that as an altercation between you and another human being or as me and X race? Like those kinds of things that are in New York, like highly volatile, emotionally driven, like there are, you know, we all have these very heated and awkward racial interactions, especially in a city like New York. And how do you navigate that? Do your values hold up even though you you are dealing with situations that make you uncomfortable or angry or upset or confusing? And I knew a lot of friends who all of a sudden were talking in ways that they would have seen as racist, like just months previous. You know, 9-11 was kind of the ultimate test for a lot of people because a, a lot of really oh, ostensibly yeah. liberal people all of a sudden weren't. Oh, it, I remember that time vividly. I was in college in Maine, so it was even more uh, kind of... Uh, the, the, the night and day of what I was experiencing versus, versus what was happening at There's home. a very special form of uh, New England racism that I think oh. a lot of people outside of the East Coast don't understand. I mean, the thing is with my, with what I experienced, it was mostly a, like a longer glance than necessary to me, you know, and that glance seemed to be just a split second longer post 9 11. Um, cause it wasn't just curiosity. Like, before, it was just curiosity. It's kind of what I was saying before, like, oh, that person looks interesting. It, it Now it becomes, oh, that person looks interesting. Where are they from? What does that mean? You know, like, it, is it safe? Which is so absurd. Um, I mean, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, I, I feel like there were so many people who were liberal, who were pro-war all of a sudden. Who were who changed into a discussion of this is our values versus their values, and even just by saying that, what does our values mean at that point? If you're going to speak in the because immediately when I hear stuff like that, I'm like, I don't think we have the same values because you just said that. And there was a lot. There was a lot of that. I mean, that, I mean, it, it, this is kind of obvious, but I suppose if you you didn't grow up with, with 9/11 as this backdrop in any way like it is the thing that has most affected how i view the world and it's funny to say that because i think we're about the roughly the same age and so we had like we're in similar places but when you talk to somebody who's 20 or 18 you know it's kind of the world there is no before right there was no like the way things were before we thought this was possible and so they've grown up in a very different set of conditions. And so I know how much it shaped me and it made me, it forced me to, it kind of, it kind of almost shocked me into, into consciousness, if that makes any sense. It, it, it was almost like, it kind of, it was like a defibrillator. All of a sudden I was awake and I'm like, what is going on? Did it make you political? Yes. I was always sensitive as a kid, and I was always thoughtful, but I'm a kid, and, you know, I echoed what I saw on TV, and, you know, uh, you're 18, and even though you grew up in uh, Queens, you know, I'm still lacking experiences. I mean, like I was saying earlier, like, growing up in a place, regardless of how diverse it is, you're not going everywhere. You're going to school and back in a few other places, maybe, and you're not in the adult world. Now it's a little different because of the internet, and the adult world and the kid world are they come together in a way that makes me incredibly uncomfortable. But like before, like that, that was your world. And it was, it was very, it was adults and kids and your education was from what you saw around you and from adults and a little bit of the internet. Um, so I, you know, I was, I was fairly sheltered in that diversity and I knew that racism existed cause I've experienced it, but also, 
you know, it was clear that my neighborhood wasn't represented in any of the media I was watching, which was a clue that what I was experiencing maybe wasn't the same everywhere. But after 9-11, it kind of became clear, like, oh, I, I'm definitely seen as an outsider in this country in a way that is even more profound than it felt before. And uh, and that also made me question, especially with the the racism, the, the anti-Muslim, anti-Brown racism that was happening post 9-11. You know, it was happening in Queens, too. Like that. I remember I worked at the DA's office one summer in college and it was the Hate Crimes Bureau. And. The things I read, I'm like, this is like absurd. Cause Business was good. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. They were, they were so, it was weird because it was the hate crimes and the youth gangs borough, which I always, I hated the fact they combined those two boroughs. Like it was like the, it was like the, it was minority crime. Like who's getting stabbed? Who's doing the stabbing? And it was just this very bizarre mix. But I remember that the, the uh, hate crime stuff kind of took the lead for that period of time. And I just remember reading cases. And just being kind of devastated because this was home. Like, it's just hard to... Because I'd been reading stuff and it was all over the country. And all of a sudden, it's home. And I'm like, this is the same shit. It's the same shit. And just because you eat, you've you had Indian food, just because you've had Indian classmates, doesn't mean you're not sheltered. And it doesn't mean that you have learned anything. And that's pretty brutal. This is now old news, but you remember uh, Randy McNally from uh, about a month or two ago? He was the, uh, I want to say he was like a deputy governor in some southern state, and he was liking the Instagram posts of this like very out twink guy and, <laughs> and got caught because he, you know, he was, he was like, he was passing all this like, uh, you oh, know, like anti trans legislation. I didn't as, hear about this. As, yeah, 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 yeah. And then all of a sudden they found like a trail of like he has he's not who you think uh, we think he is or who how he's how he's portrayed himself. Well, it's complicated. Insofar as these things can be innocent of him like liking those Instagram posts that they kind of were and that he his sort of like obviously all this coming out was a big big thing but but he he had discussed this this come to god moment that he had had recently when uh like a I, I don't know if it's a family member or a friend of the family or something like a gay, uh, a, a, you know, an LGBTQ person entered his, his life at one point and, and how that, that, that changed his worldview. And, and we hear this a lot, right? Like Dick Cheney, like lesbian daughter. So he, yeah. the one good thing that he was, the, the one thing that he was good on was, was that. And it's something that I struggle with because part of me, because I think, I think we as a society, like, kind of you know like congratulate those people or laud those people for learning their lesson but also i don't think that you should have to obviously it's it's good to have yeah. as many different kinds of people in your life as possible but i don't think you should have to have that in order to to have compassion for other people i mean i'll, I'll say i'll say two things because it made me think of two things one did you did you hear the um the story about the uh montana state legislator uh, who is supporting anti-trans legislation and her daughter is trans and basically said that like, you know, I, is aware that like this leads to suicide of trans people and basically said, if you're asking me whether, you know, the risk of my daughter's suicide, uh, would change my stance, it's no. And it, like the cruelty of that, like I'm just, I'm trying to come to terms with the, the cruelty while also acknowledging the fact that uh you know their daughter is trans like that's kind of like wait how so you're acknowledging it but at the same time you you have this horrific it's very confusing and uh and also just cruel the second thing it made me think of was why again like so much of my work has been about the importance of of media because you know i think about the fact that when i was uh, in high school, grew up in Queens. It's not, even though New York obviously, you know, has a huge gay community and like a, an incredible history. One, that history wasn't taught to us in school, right? So I didn't know about Stonewall until I was a lot older. Um, you know, the village was a punchline. It wasn't seen as a, a place with complexity and, and community it was seen as a punchline. And that's how it was tr treated in the media. It was treated you know that that's what it was it wasn't there was no understanding of what it meant to be gay living in a community and what the experience was like and so the first time that i 
remember humanizing uh, a gay person. And it's not to say that I had hatred in my heart. I was a kid, but really un- like was able to connect. One was an English teacher I had uh, who people used to behind his back tease that he was gay. And I remember thinking, if that's true, who cares? And I, uh, th- that being kind of a uh, a revelation for me at like 12. And the second thing, and maybe I'm getting the order wrong, was the real world had Pedro Zamora on it. And it was the San Francisco year. And again, growing up in New York, I'd never met someone who was openly gay. I'd never met somebody who had HIV. You know, we're talking about 12, 13, 14 years old, whatever. You probably did. You just you didn't right. weren't aware of it. Well, op- openly, right? Like I didn't. Yeah, there was. There was. I'm sure I met tons of people without even the thought. And to see him and follow his story and his life, and the fact he died from HIV and kind of the discrimination he faced too, like it it shook me. It's something that I I never you know forgot. So even if there was homophobia around me, that that you know I I didn't question. Um, that was there and it was always there. And I just remember that feeling and that pain that so many people he, he loved and, and who loved him felt. And I was media, you know, and that's even in New York city. Do you know what I mean? So to me, like, it's so easy to dehumanize unless you have some personal connection. And if you're not going to get that personal connection in reality, media then plays a, a big part in it. Like there's no way that this new generation uh, of kids, even if they're conservative, like there's a lot of folks who are conservative and still support LGBTQ rights, you know, which is amazing to me. But a lot of that has to do with, you know, media. They grew up with a different set of characters and people on TV and expectations. And um, this is not something that is seen as like an issue, you know. And so, that, I mean, that that to me is it, it's so simple, but it's like when you actually get to know someone, it changes how you view a whole group of people. And that's, you know, that's that's kind of obvious. You know, it all of a sudden makes you question maybe everyone isn't the same. And it seems so simple, but like it's, it's literally what it often ends up being. Gay characters on television is an interesting case. I, I, obviously, it's different in it's different than um, ethnic representation in that one of the things that it spurs is it spurs more people to hopefully more people to come out. Yeah. You know, this is our sort of like old man, you know, with, with, with the nine 11 thing, but I, I, you know, I'm from this ostensibly liberal area. I my there are I think about like 2000 people in my high school and seem to recall there maybe being two or three people who are actually out. And that's something that, you know, I mean, if you do want to like chart progress, like that, that is, that yeah. is, and, and that is something that I think like, I, I think probably does get lost on younger people is that it just, it, it just, it just wasn't done. And you can, you know, obviously being homophobic is, is, is not okay at any age, but like you, but you're right in that it's it's different when when you're a child. I think that you have uh, some excuse of growing up around it, but by the time you get to be, you know, the deputy governor of a state at seven yeah, years yeah. old, you've run out of excuses. Right. It's basically either ignorance or politi- political expediency, and you almost hope for ignorance because ignorance has a potential solution, and political expediency is a lot h- harder to counter. I mean, I think about the fact, like, 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 I've made this joke before, but Full House uh, took place in San Francisco and was on for so many seasons. There wasn't a single openly gay character on that show. Like, it was never discussed. It was never even in the realm of the the world they lived in. And and certainly that's a certain like San Francisco, I suppose. But there was also like, wow, like this is very bizarre to me that this will ne- this never comes up. It never gets spoken about. Like it's you're you're making this kind of vanilla, bland, quote unquote, all American sitcom in this place that like has such a fascinating history and an important history. It's worse than that because all three of the all three of the dads were in entertainment in some form. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I never met. Never met. Really, never in any of the really. 
I never thought about that, but you're right. I mean, the whole, I mean, the whole thing is just, you know, it, also like, okay, you're a comic, so that means you're working the scene. Like, so there's no gay comedians in San Francisco during that time. Not true. You're a musician. You're touring. You're like, seriously. Like, it's just the level of absurdity. And we all accepted it. I don't want to mis- mischaracterize this. So, you know, let me let me know if I'm not on the right track here. But sure. one of the things that has been interesting, you know, sort of reading reading up on, on your background and your relationship with The Simpsons prior to the documentary coming out is that is that I don't think that I don't get the sense that 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 representation was so was cut and dry as being an entirely negative or positive thing in that to a certain extent, just the act of a, you know, an Indian character occupying space on the show, like, was helpful. It was incredible. Oh, you kidding me? Like, it was exciting. Like, I, I didn't get to see anybody uh, on a show regularly that was brown. All of a sudden, there is a character. So as a kid, I was really excited. Of course, I'm really excited. And I found it funny, you know, because it, it, it is fun. Like, he's a funny character. He's also one of the most, like, well-developed of the side characters. Uh, but that happened after the fact, you know? Like, it was he wasn't built to be developed. He was built as a punchline, and he got really popular, and people really liked the catchphrase, and which was barely said. But Thank You, Come Again was barely said on that show, but it was said enough times for people to use it. Um, so, you know, I was happy and excited and then it changed as I started to realize this is all we get. And I saw like, oh, people are using this. And so it's, it's like, I still laughed. I still enjoyed it, but it was like, oh, but you know, as you get older, you start to question things. I'm like, this is weird. This is it. Cause of course I loved it initially. I didn't have anything. You're willing to take anything if you've never had anything. And that's exactly what what it was plus the show was brilliant like you know even with if you took out the the stereo the racial stereotype stuff which at the time was groundbreaking because it was the most diverse cast you ever had because it didn't require hiring actors of color so they're all (laughs) so it you know it but but still it was like well everyone's represented even if it's in a kind of crappy way everyone's represented and we never get represented and it's diverse in a way that I don't, you know, it was the most diverse show on television. Like, there was a lot of weird, confusing feelings. And it was funny, you know? Like, my God, so much of what my childhood was and my development in comedy was that show. Like, it was a Conan trifecta. It was The Simpsons, SNL, Conan. Anything that involved Conan writing or being in it, I I was absolutely uh obsessed with and so that show me and my brother watched that every sunday plus the two reruns every day after school and we bought the books and we knew the episodes and had trivia and like it was such a big part and it's not like we couldn't watch it because a poo was there you know i remember one time i've never shared the story they were doing a poo's wedding and uh there was this part where G- uh, ganesha float like lands on his head and all of a sudden he has like Ganesha's head and he's running around with it I remember watching with my parents and be like see look it's like they're talking about us because I was just so happy that we were there and they're like okay okay and it's like I'm like looking at it now it's like yeah because they're used to multi-dimensional <laughs> kind of depictions and I'm showing them a cartoon character like running around with Ganesha on his head and he, they weren't offended by it it was more like this isn't, uh, w- like, for you, this is like we exist. For us, it was like, this doesn't mean anything. This is how, th- this, okay, this is a joke that people are making here, and to you it feels like something. And looking at it now, it's like, yeah, it was kind of like the greatest hits of stereotypes. Like, there wasn't anything that was particularly unique or clever. Because, I mean, you're talking about a, a population, you know, South Asia is like, a fourth or a fifth of the world's population. Didn't India recently surpass China? I think so, yes. And so, because it's close to two billion, I think. And so it, there is also something weird about painting people with such a broad brush when we're talking about, like, a good percentage of the global population. So in that percentage, like, whether it's accents or stories or, you know, 
it doesn't really get any of the intricacies of the stereotypes either because we have our own stereotypes and we have our own like not to say that's good but I'm saying that we have our own kind of um specific ideas of of culture and like those are all ignored like it didn't really what did i've heard people say well in educate i learned more about your culture and i'm like that's not how i wanted you to learn about my culture don't say that's and what is my culture exactly because that is not quite my culture one of the things i do when i'm talking to people is i I like to check up on their social media just you know just to see like what's been on their mind lately they're talking about things like that and yeah, I, I made the mistake of of clicking through on yeah. everything everything you do, regardless of of topic. But I yeah. did see. I will say this is maybe the single funniest thing I've ever seen on Twitter, or at least of recent vintage. Uh, a response to one of this, and you've probably seen this a hundred times now, but it is uh, it is objectively very funny. Yeah, uh, response to I think maybe you know the recent interview that that you and Hank did. Hank did. did yeah, he kind of started it over again. Yeah, and it was like. Oh, you hate stereotypes, do you? And it was a it was a gif of Chief Wiggum walking across the street with donuts. Oh, I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously it's incredibly stupid. It's also just so funny to equate the two. Oh, that people don't get it. I mean, and look, the funny thing is in the interview and in the documentary, I kind of call out what I assume is going to be said afterwards. And people literally are doing that. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, I can be as meta as I want if you don't actually listen to the th- Yeah, exactly. So I already knew, even in the interview, I think I said, like, I know people are going to say this regard. Like, it, it doesn't matter what the content is, you know. And also, it doesn't matter, like, the idea that I killed a character. It's like, I don't have control over this character. And I never said we should kill the character. And I never said we should get rid of the character. I think at the bare minimal... I wanted him to stop voicing the character, I think was what I said. Or, you know, if we were going to get rid of the character, like, there's ways to do it that are a lot more clever than just, I'm not going to do it anymore because I'm afraid of what might happen. That's the other thing. Like, what backlash are are people getting at The Simpsons? Like, the fear of being called racist? Like, I'm the one who had, like, death threats and extra security at shows and still get messages every day. What What backlash are they dealing with? where they're afraid to put a character out. Because if I had enough power to cancel something, I am assume I'd have enough power to give me a TV show. So why am I wasting on canceling a character? Like, the whole absurdity of it. I'm like, you know, I'm... I'm what else? I mean, I don't... There isn't anything else to say. And I say this in the Hank interview, too. Like, I'm like, it's a... What's more interesting to me is about the after the documentary than the contents of the documentary. The cons of the do- uh, contents of the documentary are old to me. Like that's nothing that was. It wasn't. It was fun learning how to make a thing. It wasn't fun in terms of look at this content. Like some of it was interesting, but it wasn't new. It wasn't shocking. It wasn't something that uh, you know. It was really a journey for me. You know what's been interesting. The journey has been the after. Like how people on social media. Like how how media works now. People don't watch the thing. They only read headlines. They already have their opinions and, and, and they're looking for things to reinforce it regardless of the thing, re- whether it reinforces it or not. Like that part has been interesting. Like the racial politics of it. The fact that so many of the, the hate comes from Central and South America, which tells you about the global reach of The Simpsons and the idea, well, I don't know what this character sounds like there. I don't know what he represents to people there. So to people, it's just like you're killing this character I like without any social context. So maybe like, you know, like it's a much more complicated thing when you're exporting your stereotypes to another place and it it doesn't read the same way. So it's um, it's like fascinating to me, like all the stuff that came out of this. And while that it's, you know, it's been five years and and we talk about how how quickly things move in and out of the the news cycle, but that it is. Uh, again, part of it was the interview you did with Hank, but but also it, it, you mentioned it in your special, right? It, you know, it, it, you you it, you do bring it up. I I didn't want to go all in on the special, like that was one thing. Like I wanted to mention it just because I'm like, you know, because I thought about that a lot. Do I want to do a section about that on the special? And I didn't because I didn't want to trigger the basically everything that's been triggered because of that interview I I did with Hank that conversation because to stir like, it back up. Yeah, I didn't want to stir it back up because I'm, like, so done with it. Like, I and also, like, I have so many other things I want to talk about. So I kind of reference it, but I didn't want to go – because there's, there's a million other things to say about it in terms of 
the after the fact, but I just, I'm like, I'm done with it. I'm so done with it. That's what I was getting at. Like, ironically, talking more about it in order to bring mm-hmm. this point up. But but I had I had Hannibal on the show uh, a, few, a few years ago. And I know this isn't a one-to-one thing, but it was close enough after the Cosby thing that I had to ask him, is this okay that this is kind of the thing that you're known for now? Is that something that you're that you're comfortable with? I mean, obviously, you know... Y- y- he 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 certainly didn't expect the reaction that he got. He just did a stand up set that went viral. You you were putting this documentary out in the world. Yeah. You, 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 there was understanding that you were going to be associated with this thing, but are are you still are you comfortable that it's still kind of the main thing that people bring up or when they talk about you or talk to you? No. Oh god no. Like cuz it's not interesting and it's not the work I really do. I mean that's the part that sucks the most like it was it was supposed to be like a uh, a side like a side project before I worked on my special and worked on other things. Like it wasn't meant to be. Like I knew. I mean, it's not that I wasn't aware that you know there was a degree of shit starting. You know what I mean? That like I'm going to be criticizing The Simpsons in a way that no one's ever criticized them before. The the other you know uh criticism has been it's not as good as it used to be i mean that's it like there has never been any kind of critical discussion of like is this is this okay and so i already knew that was going to make noise i didn't think it was going to make five years of noise i didn't think there was going to be a global kind of reaction i didn't think that people would comment the way they did without seeing and i didn't think that it would be hard to access like it wasn't made available widely until it was on hbo max years after the fact so even if you wanted to see it, it wasn't easy to see it so uh, you know, all this stuff was unintended. And the fact that, like, you know, people will say, oh, you only got this, this, and this because of, uh, you know, you only got that special because of the cartoon. I got this special before. That's the shitty thing about all this stuff. Like, I, I got all this stuff for being a, a comic. Like, if anything, this thing has been a hindrance. It, you know, and it's not the quite the same as Hannibal because, again, like, I chose to do this, but it's similar in that, like, oh, man, like, I've done all this other work and I still do this other work. And that's the first thought in people's heads. Like, Hannibal has incredible stand-up specials. He's in one of the better stand-up comics of this era. Like, he's incredibly funny, incredibly unique. And that's what he's going to be known for, something he didn't intentionally mean to go like somebody filmed it without his permission and posted it he had been saying that on stage before that wasn't the first time he'd ever said it it was like but somebody had caught it and it and it kind of went out there i mean it it just got amplified i mean it's not the first time a south asian has said this sucks that we're depicted this way it was just the the loudest um and I guess this is what happens. I mean, at the end of the day, what gives me, and I said this in the interview, uh, the conversation I had with Hank on NPR's Code Switch, is that I know I'm right. Like, somebody wrote, somebody wrote in one of the tweets that, like, uh, like, as I mentioned my kid, I don't like when other people mention my kid because, because it's, I'm, obviously, but somebody said that, like, how's your kid gonna feel when he finds out that you killed Apu when he gets older? I'm like, first of all, he's not gonna know what The Simpsons is because kids now don't know what The Simpsons is. Secondly, he's going to see that character without the context of what was there before, even though it was messed up before, too. And they're going to be like, this is racist. And you helped get rid of this racist character? Like, how is that going to? No, uh, there's no it, people there. Think about all the stereotypical things that happened in the past, whether it's Mickey Rooney's Breakfast at Tiffany's, you know, racist character or I mean, the history of like black minstrelsy. You don't think people fought and probably said similar things like it's just a joke? In the beginning, not even because people's voices weren't even heard in protest. But at a certain point, like, you don't think people were like, Amos and Annie is funny. What's the issue? And we look at it now and we're like, oh, boy, this doesn't look good. So, I mean, I mean, that's I mean, it's obvious to me, like, you're going to you're going to push against the changing tide of culture. Like, and guess what? Like racism in this blatant way doesn't really win anymore. It's usually the subtle stuff that survives. So this is like easy. It is something, I don't want to say funny, but it is something that's really interesting about the trans conversation right now are, are again, like there are even people who are, if not okay, are, are, are very like li- live and let live with, with gay people who are now like, that's where they draw the line in the sand. And, and it's so strange to me 
to not just take like a just a look back at very recent history and realize that 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 the, the fun, this is fundamentally not a different thing and it makes no sense that you weren't on the right side of history before but you you are now they're saying the same things like the old conversation was that gay folks were pedophiles and your kids should be afraid like there's a predatory kind of tone that was discussed about them and trans people it's like we can't use the bathrooms because you know you're going to put you know people at risk and they're as if like, what are you talking about do you know what I mean? Like that that kind of character judgment is absurd. It's an absurd thing. And and it's still like is spoken about as if it's mental illness, the way, you know, homosexuality it was homosexuality was was listed in in like medical journals as a as a psychiatric condition, you know? I don't know the history of like um, you know, how how trans folks were defined in medical terms. I'm sure it wasn't positive. You know what I mean? Like this is this this is the same stuff. You know what I mean? Like it this does not impact people's day-to-day lives other than the people who are actually from the group. Like the rest of it is just, you know, it's a lot of politicians using an issue to fuel fire because it's very easy to unite against uh people to scapegoat and be like these people are going to come, you know, hurt your kids, you know, versus like Hey, how come we don't have jobs? Uh, it's because the, the companies are bringing it to other countries. But aren't you getting money from companies who are bringing it to, you know what I mean? It's like there's no responsibility and there's no, like, real discussion of what's going on. And this is so easy to find people like, hey, look over there. And people fall for it. And it's so cruel. And, I mean, just that story we were talking about for the Montana legislature, like, you're telling me that if your daughter dies, you're like, it was for the movement to deny trans rights? Like, she, she died, and it, it was a good thing for what I believe. Like, what are you, are you out of your mind? Are you so, like, there? there is nothing. There is nothing that should be bigger than your child. Like, that is just... You think God wants to see you in heaven and say, thank you for letting your child go? Isn't there a story in the Bible where... I, I think there might be multiple ones, but... Yeah, where you like, where it's like, yeah, you were threatening to kill your your child, and so I, that shows your faith. Do you think you're that? You think this is an act of... This has been kind of my fundamental thesis lately, is that I don't even think the issue, the biggest issue that, that we face now as a society is our solutions. I think the biggest issue that we face right now is that we can't agree on the causes like what 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 it, what is actually leading to these things and it is so disparate right now that that one side is basically like hey yeah kind of maybe capitalism is eating itself right now and you know maybe we're squeezing the last dregs and then the other side is like uh you know drag queen story hour right, right and right. and that's the disconnect right and and that we can never we'll never agree on a solution until we can agree like we all know it's bad that's the thing everybody knows it's real bad right now it, you know, and and we, and we just can't we just can't agree on why. I mean, it, it's so much, like look what Martin Luther King was doing towards the end of his life. It was like this poor people's project, which was uniting working class people, regardless of race, about this common issue of you know how capitalism is pitting them against each other, and they're all being paid significantly less than they deserve. They're not being paid living wages, and that was. You know, that's literally finding the wedge issue race and trying to, to remove it in order to, for people to see their interests. And that's, that's the same thing now. Like, it's so much easier to, to push something that really does not affect your life on a day to day level, does not like impact your, your, how much money you get every week that doesn't affect your future doesn't reflect will will i be okay when i'm 80 years old will i have health it doesn't affect anything it does not affect how you function and it's easy to distract people so it's 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 really difficult because how do you take that away and at the end and also i don't think the democratic party has been particularly good at like seeing ahead like they've always tried to go towards the middle and when the middle is moving further right, it's not like they've shifted. And also the old guard doesn't see what's happening. 
Like, there's there's a movement that's bubbling underneath, and Dianne Feinstein's still the, a senator from California. Nancy Pelosi has been there forever, and Charles Schumer, I don't think, is going to let go of any power. And and to me, it, it's like, do you, like, they didn't need, I mean, think about Obama. Like, he wasn't the candidate everybody wanted. He wasn't the establishment's candidate. It was from, from a... Just his will, from his personality, from what he was able to to, to project and, and, and inspire people. That wasn't what the Democratic Party was aiming for. So as a result, you're always going to be weak because you're, you're always going to be in a, a defensive position. And that's, that's the way they've played it. And so I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day, when you think about just between climate change and the rest of it, it just seems kind of absurd that the attention that we're spending is not where it needs to be when, you know, there's a, a dire, you know, existential threat staring at us. And that is, you know, that is not the priority. So I do want to make one more mention of the special because we haven't discussed it much. And I'm going to do something really bad in this interview that I'm, yeah. I'm sure that you and all other comedians hate. But I'm going to I'm going to make you dissect a joke Go ahead. because I think it's really relevant here. And I think okay. it was one of the funnier parts of the new special. Tell me. In fact, it was to a certain extent related to, I think, if I remember correctly, the Apu thing. But you make a joke about you being a coward, about you not doing that same joke. Uh, like, and we, we, I can't remember what southern city it was. It was Richmond. Richmond. I, I, I mean... It's not true. It is, it's not true. Okay. There, it, there's no truth to that? Yeah. Of course I did the joke there. I mean, it's. I just wanted to... I feel like one thing I've lacked in some of my previous stand-up is turning it on myself. And showing that I am not, like, perfect. And even with my criticisms or with my stances, that I am I'm fallible. And I don't think I've done enough of that in the past. And I think it's important to show vulnerability. And so, you know, it, it seems I'd like the idea of talking big. But when actually confronted, you don't say anything. In truth, I did the jokes there, too. And it went over well some nights and not in other nights. But, like... I think it it was funny to put it on me. Like I'm afraid for all my talk. I'm afraid, and uh, so that that's why I did that. Yeah, it's a self selecting group of people, right? The ones who are you st- who are you doing stand up to? I mean, unless you're at a festival or something. Well, well, even in the clubs, because in Richmond, I don't have a huge base. You know that that was part of the goal. Like when I'm going to Cleveland, I'm not going to be able to sell out five shows with my base. So. When I do club runs, for the most part, it's not just my base. And that's actually part of why doing runs at clubs is really useful because you get the repetition and you also get fans, but you also get people that aren't loving it. And you still have to find ways to like bridge that gap. Like when I'm doing a, a, a single show at a place, it's fair to assume it's going to be almost all my fans because why else would you go out to just, you know what I mean? Like if it was, you're not going to see to the comedy show. In the comedy club, you're going to see me in a theater or a rock club. It's very specific. So and I can see the difference in, in those shows when you're there to see me versus I have no idea what I'm expecting and I don't like this. And that and that's, you know, split audiences can be frustrating, but at the same time, they're kind of fun because you actually have to figure out, okay, how do I solve this puzzle? You don't pull punches at the end of the day. No. I mean, I'm I'm smart about how I play it. Like, sometimes I'm like... Like, there's a certain point where you're like, I've been punching a lot. It's not working. Let me win them back. That's survival. Like, it's not that, like, I'm not going to do any of the hard material because it's not going to work with this crowd. It's I need to find a way to ease them in. because, And that's another reason why it's important to make yourself vulnerable and, and the, uh, why it's important to be more personal. Because that's one thing with this special I'm I'm proud of because – there was a lot of personal stuff, especially early, about having a kid and stuff. There's stuff that's a little more relatable up top. It doesn't get really heavy and hard till some of the uh, vaccination stuff and then going into the, you know, the end with Tucker Carlson. But up to then, it's fairly even and, and, and relatable. And I think that's good because all of a sudden when I get to the heavier stuff, you would think that I would uh, – I've won enough of the audience where this guy's like my friend. He's been my friend for the past half an hour. And you're more willing to listen to your friend share an opinion than some rando telling you you're wrong. And if you like the person, you're more willing to be like, oh, let's see where this is going. I've earned your trust. 
and 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 you trust it'll be funny or interesting. And so, you know, it, it's I'm not necessarily not going to do a bit, but I'm definitely going to think about where to place it. And if I don't do it, it's because I've done three other ones where I think I pushed them enough. Let's go elsewhere. Like, it's not going to be a completely different show. It's not going to be a show that, like, isn't me. Because I'm not going to do that. And I can't do that. A lot of this new hour, I think, is that I'm developing is about that. It's about trying to build a mainstream career when you talk about what you talk about. And throughout this next hour, and who knows if it actually ends up being what the next hour is, but I'm attempting to do what I call, quote-unquote, observational humor. And what does observational humor look like when it's coming from me? Like talking about Starbucks in a way that lacks any... I want to talk about Starbucks without talking about workers' rights or about, like, you know, health insurance and all that. I'm just going to talk about Starbucks. Could I pull it off? And so there's a lot of this new hour that's, like, me trying to do that and trying to be relatable. And at the end of it, it's saying that, like, who I am is is not to be negotiated with. I can't. You can't negotiate with, with what who you are. 